go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everyone. This is How to Get a Meeting with Anyone with guest speaker Stu Heineke. Stu, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Glad, glad to be here. Glad to have you here. wanted to uh, thank Keaton Scadden for helping put this together. Um, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have made the connection with, with Stu, and so really wanted to send out a special thanks to him. For those of you who aren't familiar with Stu's work, uh, he's a Wall Street Journal cartoonist, and he's also famous for creating contact marketing campaigns to get a 100% response rate. And that's something I think is extremely relevant, especially today, because I think a lot of salespeople are really struggling in this area. And one of the things that Stu wanted to share with us is some of the case studies and actual results that he's seen, both personally and also with some of uh, his partners in different case studies. So, I don't um, Stu, could you share a few of those case studies and stories with us on, on what works for other folks in this in this space? Sure. In fact, you know, I think maybe it might be helpful to start with the story that got me started in contact marketing. Um, and, and that is, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a cartoonist. I'm a cartoonist and a marketer. And when uh, way back when I was starting my business, um, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to create direct marketing campaigns for the big magazine publishers. Um, things have changed since then. You know, like the, the publishers are barely there. But um, but the, at the time, they were the biggest user, most sophisticated users of, of contact. Or, I mean, of um, direct marketing. And so, um, and, and what I wanted to do, by the way, was I wanted to mix cartooning and marketing. And I did that against all this advice from um, David Ogilvy and then all of his acolytes who used to say that humor doesn't work in, in advertising. And they're just so wrong. They, they were so far off <laughs> the mark. I knew they were they were way off the mark because I knew that cartoons already were shown by, by readership surveys to be the best read and remembered parts of, of magazines and newspapers. So why wouldn't they be, I mean, they're powerful. So why wouldn't they be powerful devices in marketing campaigns? And so my first two assignments were for Rolling Stone and Bon Appetit magazines. And both of these test campaigns that I created beat their controls. What that means is in, in statistics, we always measure against a control group um, you know, a constant and in a constant against which you measure results of the test and uh, in direct marketing that that control is the most effective thing they've ever mailed so if you tie the control you've just beat, you or rather you've just tied the record if you beat the control which is what I did on both of those you have just set new records so my first two campaigns out of the box for publishers set new records. And I thought, okay, great, that's my opening to bring this to the rest of the publishing industry. And what that meant was I needed to bring, uh, or rather I needed to connect with about two dozen VPs and directors of, of um, circulation or consumer marketing, you know, with companies like Time Inc. and Condé Nast and the Wall Street Journal and Forbes and so on. So, and I, you know, and I thought, well, you know, if I, I really need to reach all of these people. In fact, if I got a, you know, the, this, we used to hear that if you get a 1% response rate to a direct marketing campaign, you were doing really well. And there's no such number really, but if, if we applied that number here, 1% of 24 people would have, wouldn't even amount to, wouldn't have amounted even to one person. So that would, would have been a disastrous campaign. And, and even a 10% response rate would have been, I think, just really disappointing. I wanted a 100% response rate. So, and, and, you know, back then we were also told that 100% response rates were impossible to achieve. And they probably are in direct, maybe in direct mail, but not in what I was just about to embark on. So what I did was I put together a little campaign. It's an, a, a, it consisted of a, an 8 by 10 print of a cartoon, and the cartoon was about the recipient, each recipient that I was sending this to. And with that went a note that said, this is the device I just used to beat the controls for Rolling Stone and Bon Appetit. And I think we should put this to the test for your titles. And um, when I'm live in front of a group, I'll usually ask the group, what do you think I got for a response? But we, no one can raise their hand and, and give those numbers. But I'll just tell you that, that I broke through to all of them. All of them, all of them uh, took my calls. All of them uh, talked with me. And, and so that was already 100% response rate to the campaign, but they also, all of them converted to clients, all of them. I got all of them as clients. And so that all came about from sending, you know, this little campaign to just 24 people 
who happen to be very, very tightly targeted. I mean, for just the list of the, of the people that I really needed to connect with to make this happen. So, so the composition, the composition of the list was important, but also the campaign was. And I humanized myself. I, I sent them something they hadn't seen before, and I sent them something with results that I knew was 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 were going to stand out to them because they're always looking for the next breakthrough. They need to keep beating those those controls. So um, anyway, so so it was 100% response rate, 100% conversion, um, and. Really, it launched my business, and it all came from a campaign that I spent about a hundred dollars on. So that's kind of the that's emblematic of what contact marketing is. It's it's these campaigns that are really micro focused. They could be they could be um, going to just I mean to an audience of just one person actually, but that's not typically what what they're doing. But you know, let's say no more than the than a hundred or, or maybe even a few dozen people. Uh, who can make all the difference in the world to you, and and with, with people that are that important, you want to be able, to, or, yeah, you want to be able to break through, but you want to think in terms of really doing something that that causes you to stand out and humanizes you. So I don't know how we're doing for time. Do, do we have time for maybe one more? Yeah, I th- definitely think so. I, and I also think there's okay. two big takeaways here um, from that original story. One, I think that. Um, doesn't have to be a big audience. In fact, a lot of times the more narrow and the more focused, I think the easier it is to attract these guys. But also I think that, uh, like you said, it needs to be humanized. They need to understand this is this is coming from a real person. And it was something that, you know, I think it's it's great that it's it's also great to know that there's more than one case study where there's really very high response rates, which hasn't been seen very often, and I think it's it's a great lesson for all of us. But yeah, if you could share a few more, that would be wonderful. Sure, sure. Well, well, there's another one that's one of my favorites, um, and 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 that is uh, um, well, Dan Waldschmidt is. I don't know if you know him, but he's one of the top sales bloggers in the world, and his his, his blog is called Edgy Conversations. And Dan is also. Uh, an extreme athlete. He runs hundred mile races and wins. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So there's this, you know, ultra competitive knife's edge personality to his brand, to his personal brand. Um, and what Dan does though for a living is he's a turnaround specialist and he has this really interesting way of reaching out to CEOs of, of, um, of companies that are in trouble. What he does is he scans the business news every, <clears throat> pardon me, every morning. And he's looking for stories of missed earnings estimates. And when he finds one, he um, he has this sword made up. And the swords are beautiful. They're they're actually made by the prop maker who made all the swords for the movie Gladiator. So that they're just this beautiful sword. And he engraves the CEO's name on the on the blade, and then uh, a quote either by uh, one of his quotes or uh, there's another one by Tupac Shakur. Either way, it's a pretty cool little gift, right? So it's a wow. full size sword, and it goes into this beautiful wooden box felt lined wooden box and he puts a little handwritten note in there saying, Hey, uh, dear Bob or whoever he's sending it to, um, you know, I, I understand that war, I mean, the, the business is war. And I noticed that you lost a, bat, lost a battle recently. And I just wanted to let you know that if you ever need a few extra hands in battle, we've got your back. So what's really interesting about there's lots of interesting things about this one is, I mean, he spends a thousand dollars every time he does this. So you don't want to send this to someone who, isn't a good prospect for one, yeah. but um, but another is you think about the about the lack of let's say traditional branding elements. There were no he, he didn't write this this well, his note was written out by hand. It was not written on letterhead. Um, he signs his name and put probably puts his phone number or his email address. But um, he, there's no none of the traditional elements of branding like logos, for example. Um, still. There's all kinds of branding in this because of the audacity and the humanity of it. Because this guy noticed you, you, um, you, you, you missed an earnings estimate. You're now probably one of the loneliest people in the world. People don't want to talk to CEOs of, of companies that are floundering a bit. And and so here he is reaching out and offering to go to battle for you or with you, um, with a very tangible thing that you know, this beautiful gift that, you know, it's not a gift that you would, it's not a traditional gift. It's not like sending someone um, I, I, something, something they could use in their home. It's a, it's actually a visual metaphor for the value that Dan 
it, that Dan will bring to the bring to the fight, really. And and because the sword, you know, I actually have one, uh, a sample of one of his swords. I mean, it's just it's all metal, uh, metal and wrapped leather handle, and, and it's just a beautiful piece. It's really high quality, and and all, it says a lot about who Dan is and how he executes whatever he does. So as a result of that, he gets uh, essentially 100% response rate to that campaign. And, and even though he's spending $1,000, okay, and that probably sounds like a really shocking number, um, it's okay because when he gets engagements, it's worth a you million know, dollars and up. So he can afford to send a few swords before he, uh, before he makes a sale. But every one of these CEOs returns his call. <laughs> That's pretty amazing too. Wow. <clears throat> Well, and you know, so, I think – oh, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, you know, you mentioned takeaways from the other one. I think one of them is that visual metaphors are a great way to communicate a lot in very in a very, very short – like a, in an instant, actually. Um, that sword is a visual metaphor for what – who Dan is, how competitive he is. It's it's a visual metaphor for his personal brand of the, the, at knife's edge and ultra competition or, or being ultra competitive – and just that he's going to go to battle for you. And it's all said in one one beautiful item that um, people look at and they just go, I get it. So um, that's that's certainly one of them. What, I, I, I'm just curious, what shows up for you? What what shows up for me? Sorry, what was that? I, I mean, as a takeaway from, from the from the story, oh, anything show up yeah, to you about yeah. that? Yeah, I think definitely the, the ability to communicate – in a different format other than words and especially with some type of a physical object is is really much more impactful for the individual. But also I think it shows how confident he is in what he's doing to mm-hmm. the customer as well. And so if he's going to make that type of an investment to show them the value that he brings to the table in a format that's different from anything else, I think the customer can also sense that this is the real deal and can take him seriously. But I also yeah. love the context. He's, he's using data intelligence to figure out where to focus his time based off of news reports about companies that are struggling. And I think any company that's struggling probably has a little bit more um, interest in actually talking to someone. And sometimes we overlook that as an opportunity to, to pursue. Typically, we're looking at companies that are growing. But usually, the those that are more humble – or, or who have been humbled through those types of experiences would probably be a good prospect. Yeah, I think so. In fact, it kind of reminds me of your service. Um, if we're talking about a trigger event. is a very different trigger event than than what what your uh, platform identifies. But but it's it, you know the the information rather the the communication is relevant um, to their circumstances right now. You know the the other thing that I think is actually the the, the um, this really kind of illustrates well what the objective of contact marketing should be. I mean, again, it's micro-focused campaigns going to people who are of, of the greatest importance to you, the people who can really change the scale of your business or of your career. Um, but, um, but, but also, it's just I, I, I think that really the thing that we want to be shooting for. I, I, I said human, humanizing before, but really what we want people to do as a result of being on the receiving end of these campaigns is to say. Wow, I love the way this person thinks. I got to meet him, and and yeah. you know, you can imagine that that happens pretty. Well, I know that that happens with my cartoons a lot, but I know that that also happens with Dan's swords. And by the way, you know, contact marketing isn't just cartoons and swords. <laughs> it's there's there's a lot of there's all kinds of ways of of addressing important people and breaking through. But certainly, these are two pretty. I mean, they're 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 great examples of it. Yeah, and in your book you have a ton of great examples behind gifts and things of that nature. Are there any non-tangible, um, maybe incentives, maybe the industry insights, anything that you might consider valuable to to generate appointments? Well, absolutely, because you know you want. I mean, if you really you want to be you want to be humanized, of course, that you want to be, I think, audacious in in the way that you. Act, I mean, that, that you reach out, but also you've really got to bring value. And what you want, I think what, you, what we want these people that we're reaching out to, to to experience with us is that we become trusted advisors. So if you're offering 
uh, particularly if it's periodic research, but research that helps them see around corners, see around uh, see into the future of their of their markets and, and the conditions and trends that they'll be facing and, um, and so forth. I mean, so research and and insights, maybe even just collections of articles, or 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 it could be um, it could be accounts of of speeches that were given at, at, at um, trade events that they weren't able to attend, anything like that, anything that helps them understand the, the, the markets and the world around them and where the opportunities might be, or what, just what's happening, what people are saying. I think that's really valuable to, uh, to anyone in the C-suite. And so those are great, great methods for, or great devices for, um, for reaching out and connecting with people who can make a big difference to you. I think another one, that, because we're talking about intangibles, really is offering so offering someone uh, media exposure or an opportunity to tell their story. If you have a if you have a blog or a, or a podcast, um, these are great ways to connect with people or create connections that that last quite. I mean, once you've interviewed someone, for some reason, there's just a great bond there, and um, and you're there, you've, there's an opening to say, hey, by the way. Um, who handles this or that for you? Because I don't. I also sell this, or we 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 address this for our, our clients, and I'd love to see if there are some solutions that might make sense for your company. So, so you know, that that, that media exposure, I think, is a great one as well. Um, but yeah, there, I, I I think that there. You know, here's the thing. I think if you, what you really want to do, I think, or what I think makes a lot of sense is to is to take a multimodal approach. So you're not just sending one thing or doing one thing all the time. You're, you're, trying, you're changing it up a lot. And I think that keeps people engaged and intrigued. Yeah, I think that anything different definitely helps um, make the connection. And I like the, uh, the media topic that you talked about. We, in your book, you talked a lot about getting appointments through book interviews or any other types of interviews. And I think that's a great great segment. We've talked about this on some of our past calls here with Sable and talked a lot about your ideas and, and past topics from your book, but there's a lot of different ways to open the conversation with the client, and I think for the most part, we just need to use, look at ways that are non-traditional to help demonstrate what we're doing and, and open the conversation in, in new paths. But uh, um, as far as appointments go, do you see any trends or changes taking place in the near future or in the future that that might be helpful for us to see? Do you have any insights around that area? So you mean the future of getting appointments? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think, well, yeah, probably there are two, two things that really, really stand out to me. One of them is that AI is becoming a force in every aspect of life and certainly is and will be increasingly in sales. So you're an example. I mean, and Sable is a great example of that. You're you're watching for buying signals. You found found a, a way to uh, to do a, a really deep scrape and find buying signals uh, within within someone's within a, a user's network and and identify the people who are, or let's say, based on what they're doing, um, they look like they're ready to buy something. I, I think that's you know that's, that's something we didn't have. So obviously, we didn't have before. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's an interesting one that I've been using for a while called um, X.AI or Amy. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I think I have heard of that. That's a pretty interesting one. Um, it's it's an, another – I don't even know what to call these. Are they AI platforms or agents? Or I don't even know. What because I'll tell you what, they end up becoming almost – they almost, they, they almost become human themselves, and certainly Amy is a great example of that. What what happens is, if you're if you're um, in a, a an email conversation with someone, and you say, well, why don't we set up a, a call? Why don't we set up a call between us, or why don't we set up a call next week between uh, you and I, and then two other people? Um, and you can say, okay, great, I'll have Amy follow up on that. And they don't know what that Amy's an AI agent. So you just what all you do is you copy. Uh, of course, you have to have an account first, but when you, then you copy amy.ingram at x.ai, and of course you copy the other two so that they know that we're trying to get a meeting set up, and then Amy takes over, and it's really it's a thing to behold because um, all of a sudden an email will go out from Amy to all of the other participants to say um, Stu and and um, Roberta are are looking to set up. Uh, a call between all four of you 
uh, will any of these three times work? So, so it, I'm going to say she because it, it, it seems so human so quickly. So wow. I'm just going to say that. So she checks your schedule and finds three, three <laughs> times that, that, um, that are open and, um, and suggests those in an email to all of the, all of the other participants. And they'll answer back you know, whatever they answer. And the, the, the platform is so good that it understands all, it understands all of this. Um, so it understands conversational English, and it's just and it's excellent at it. So uh, it says, okay, great, uh, and, and maybe there's an agreement on one of those time slots, or maybe not. So then um, she says, okay, hang on, I'll 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 be back with a few. Or how about these these three? But she doesn't say hang on, and I'll check. But how about these three? Do any of these three work for all all of you? And uh, so this is all going on in the background, and we know that that there's all this pinging back and forth to set up appointments. It's just so time wasting. Um, you know, okay, great. What, what's the phone? What number should we call in? Should we use my bridge or your bridge? Um, what, wow. what is this? Are you on Easter time or, you know, or central time? And all of those things back and forth just chew up time and they're, they're unnecessary. But Amy takes care of all those things. So as the user of Amy, I mean, of X.AI, of this platform, all you know is you say, okay, I'll, I'll have Amy follow up, and the next thing you know, Amy is saying, um, "This is well, just confirmed. This is the time that you'll have the call." So that's that's the experience of it, and it's amazing. Now, and Amy is so it's so realistic that, and there's just this voice of. Um, by the way, you can also have a male version. I think Andrew uh, Ingram also is available, <laughs> but anyway, I was using the Amy version. So um, Amy is just is this this very professional language. Um, but very helpful in tone, um, like she's sort of like the ultimate assistant, and it's so convincing that uh, that they've Amy has actually gotten proposals for marriage and, and dates, of course. <laughs> she's actually gotten wow. proposals, so people believe it so so thoroughly that it's working. And then we see, you know, AI showing up in in all sorts of other support roles for for sales reps. Um, Identifying leads, um, identifying, t- researching the tone you should take in your emails with one one person versus another, um, who you should be following up with, all those things. I, I, so I think AI will be a really big force. I, obviously, it is, and it will it, it'll be a, uh, in greater and greater rates of adoption, and uh, and I think it'll be great. It'll make sales a little easier, uh, like yours, like your platform does. Um, the other one, sort of going the other direction for the next book that I'm working on, I'm working on the follow-up to how to get a meeting with anyone now. And so this one will be a presentation of probably something like seven case studies. And one of the areas that I, I thought was really interesting was business cards. It, you know, some people just think business cards are obsolete already, like they shouldn't be handing them out or it's wasteful. I don't know. They, they, but the problem is they're handing out cards that don't do anything. I mean, oh, sure, they, they have contact details, but you can you can trade contact details pretty easily by phone, I mean, with each other's phones. Or you can you can connect. You can just say, look, let's connect right now on LinkedIn while you're in a room networking with people. But that doesn't create the kind of impression that some cards, some really unusual cards do. And so there's a sort of class of business cards that actually, I think, graduates beyond being a business card to being – a, 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 camp, a contact campaign that you carry in your pocket. Um, you know, there's, there's, if, if I can, if I can share an example, I think that would help. Are we, are we okay for yeah. time? Okay. So, yeah, so there's yeah, one. Start, okay, great. So this one guy, uh, Ethan Goller is the president of a company called structural graphics. And what structural graphics does is they make the, they do a lot more now, but what they started with and still do is they create these pop-up ads that show up in magazines or in cards or whatever, it's either mailed formats or, or um, in print media. So you open the page and all of a sudden, boom, this whole world erupts from the page. It's a, it's a paper sculpture. And um, so Ethan, uh, the president, calls on ad agencies in, in, in New York quite often, on, on particularly on Madison Avenue. And he, what he shared with me was that when he's in a building, knows he's going to have an appointment with maybe one or two agencies, he'll... When he arrives, he also checks the, the tenant roster to see what other agencies are in the building, and he does a quick Google search to figure out who their creative director is, makes a note of that. And then when he's finished with his appointments, he stops by at these other, let's say this other agency, or maybe a few of them in the building, and he'll stop, 
to, to speak to the receptionist, and the receptionist wants to know what he wants, and he'll say, he'll explain, well, I'm 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 here in the building. I'm meeting with um, X Y Z and A B C agencies in the building, but they're all they're my clients. But um, I also wanted to just stop by and introduce myself to Chris Stevens, the, whoever the the the, uh, the creative director is. We'll call him Chris Stevens for now. So I wanted to meet with Chris Stevens real quickly just to introduce myself maybe for five minutes. Now, all of that would be rejected generally by a receptionist. Um, and if not by the receptionist, certainly the creative director. They're not waiting for, for you to show up you know, and ask for five yeah. minutes of their time. So everything changes, though, when he hands the receptionist the business, his business card. So his business card is a fold-over card and when you open it up, a couple of paper sculptures emerge um, of, a, of a laptop computer and a, a printer. I guess it doesn't really matter what the what the sculptures are. It could be a dragon or a bird, but whatever it is, he's it's a demonstration immediately of what he does and really kind of the fun of what he does. And so when he hands the the, the card to the receptionist, they're always saying they they open it up and they go. Oh, that's really cool. You know what? Hang on a second. And they'll go get the, the creative director and the creative director saying, that's a pretty cool card. Now tell me more about what you do. And they have the meeting. So this, his business card is not just, you know, here are my contact details. Um, and, and it's not, hey, why don't we just hook up on, on LinkedIn? Why don't we connect on LinkedIn right now? Or here's my VCF file. It's none of those things. It's an actual campaign that demonstrates his value, the value that he wants to bring to the creative director, and really, I think, demonstrates the value of of the creative director needing to know about about uh, about Ethan and what he does. And so, these cards they they just operate on a very very different basis. And there's some really cool ones. I don't know if you've ever heard of the the, the, um, the notorious hacker Kevin Mitnick, but Kevin has probably the coolest business card in the world. It's a a metal card, and there and it's, there are these pieces well this this is pieces that you can that you can punch out of his card and they they are a tool set for picking locks and kevin is now uh, one of the one of the leading uh, experts and certainly consultants in it security so his whole I mean, everything he offers is about preventing people from picking the lock to your it system so it's pretty cool i think probably well, probably a lot yeah. of your audience will know who he is actually but he's got i think probably the coolest business card in the world when he gives speeches, um, the people at the speeches, and he gives these speeches all over the world, the, the audience knows that he's got these cards and that he's going to give out a few, at least, I don't know, a few hundred of them, something like that. And they, they actually climb all over each other to get to the cards, <laughs> which is not what's yeah. happening with my cards. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and there's even one, one other one. Uh, this will be the final example. But there's one other one, uh, a card that was done for a personal trainer. And what they did was they got this you know, a business card size piece of, of or a sheet of, of gum rubber. So it's that natural tan colored rubber and the, the the cards are stretched and then his contact details are printed on there. So left to over, it's to dry overnight. And so then when they spring back to their original shape, all of his contact details are scrunched up. You can't read them. So when someone encounter when someone's handed his card, in order to read it, you've got to pull on both sides of it, stretch it, to read his card. And then it says Paul Nielsen, fitness trainer, and there's his phone number. And guess what? He already has you started exercising, <laughs> you know, just stretching the card. <laughs> and I think that's pretty cool. I mean, it shows a lot about a, sort of a playful aspect of his his personal brand, perhaps, but also just, hey, this is going to be fun working out with this guy. He makes it fun already. He's already made it fun. I've already started working out. <laughs> you know? And he said that this is the important part. He said that every time he hands one of those out, he gets three or four new clients. And I don't know if, uh, well, my business cards don't do that. They are, they will. I'm changing my business cards. But, you know, business cards can be pocket contact campaigns, and I think that's pretty cool. And I, I hope that we see that in the future as well. Yeah, a lot of this feels like a virtual sales force, as if these inanimate objects are essentially selling us for, you know, to our clients and doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us. I, I also think they see do. that, yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. It's also great that it's, I think that we only have maybe a split second to let that decision maker decide whether or not they want to even engage with us. Yep. By having that instant 
communication about our value and who we are and catching their attention, I think that's why this formula works so well is because it allows us to actually instantly communicate the value because a lot of times we try to do that through words and it never they never get past the first sentence and the value is never even foreseen. foreseen. Yeah. So I think a lot of these strategies allow us to actually get in the door by by jump-starting the whole value proposition instantly, even when the uh, the customer isn't even aware of it. So I think I really love yeah. the way this is this 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 works. Yeah, you're so right. That's that's a great summary of it. It's really just it's I, you know all those uh, it humanizes you. It it causes people to. Um, I think it causes people to – all of this happens immediately. It's sort of like with a cartoon. You laugh, you read it, and you laugh. But there's a lot going on in that process. You're, you're saying, oh, my God, that's true. You know, I agree with that. But what a funny twist, twist to that. That was fun. That was, that was, that was enjoyable. Um, and I get it. Um, and so that happens with all of these, with the swords, with, the, with these business cards I've described. They're, they, they work sort of on that same basis of, of a gag. You, you, uh, you encounter it. And then you immediately you get it, and and usually you're smiling because of it. You're just going whoa, and yeah. I think that you know instantly they're saying I love the way you think, man. I love the way you think. We've got to meet, and so in that split second, and and you know another I mean a, a really great um, example of that is what happens when the receptionist is handed when Ethan um, hands that that card to the receptionist, the, the pop up, you know, the pop out card. Um, and and the receptionist plays with it and says, "Oh my God!" So there's a transition there that's really important, and that's the whole reason for using contact marketing. That's genius. I, I love it. <clears throat> and you know, when I first read your book, I, I couldn't believe that I had finally stumbled across something that was uh, this powerful. I had gone through a lot of different sales books, and everybody focuses on after the meeting. But this is really the first and most important book that focuses on getting the meeting, which is what I think all of us need. Um, if you, I, I'm putting up your link here on the site. Um, if you go to his website, if you haven't read the book, you can get access to, to it there. Um, there's, it's, it's definitely something that you can read over and over again. And we'll, we'll take a few minutes now, if it's okay with you, Stu. Sure, yeah, um, yeah. Take a few questions. Um, yeah. One of the questions from Sherry was uh, any ideas, and we've talked about a lot of ideas, but she's looking for an affordable visual metaphor. So any examples? Well, any yeah. You know, there? you know what's really funny is, um, and I'm going to put this one in my book. Someone, someone sent me a block of wood in the mail. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much that cost him, but I can't. can't I mean, the postage was more than what he spent, and I, you know, I can. You could make a. The thing is, you could make an argument for a block of wood to be a, a visual metaphor. I mean, um, um, I don't know. Suddenly, I'm drawing a blank as to what it would be, but you know, I, I think that that makes an interesting one. Another one that I, I think is really cool is, um, you know, when you're in delis and with places where food is sold, there are displays of of the food, and generally those are fake because otherwise they go, you know, they, they wouldn't want all these fruits going bad. <laughs> I mean, that's the display yeah. you're gonna, that's going to entice you to, to buy something from, from the store or from the counter. And so there's all these fake food items. Um, and I'm looking at one right now. It's on my desk. And it's, a, it's an ice cream cone that has spilled. It's fallen over and it's melting. But it's all plastic. And it's utterly realistic. I mean, again, because it has to look like the food. Um, and and I, so I love those spills that... Um, that are available. It spills meaning there, there's a coffee. A, you can get a coffee cup that has fallen over, or a coffee mug, or a glass of milk. And you know, spilled milk. That's a metaphor for a lot, you know for lost opportunities. And certainly, if a if an ice cream cone fell over and started melting, you don't get to eat it. And so that's a great visual metaphor for you know opportunities that that come and are there very briefly. And if you're not there to take advantage of them, you miss them. You miss out. So I think there are a lot of a lot of them. Someone, and I mentioned this in the book that someone um, sent a box of nails to someone because they just they weren't getting through, and he wanted to know how how are, you know what does it take to get through to this person? So they just sent a box of nails, and they said it's been tough as nails to get a hold of you, and they got a call back. 
So I think there's all kinds. Yeah, you can look yeah. at almost any object and say that could be a visual metaphor to to um, express this or to dramatize some aspect, something. It could be a pair of glasses. It could be an abacus. It could be a slide rule because the slide rules are great um, metaphors for the way we used we used to do things. So I think there's all kinds of things. Just look around. Now, um, I, I will say that one of the places that I think is really interesting to find really interesting visual metaphors or just gifts in general are some of the museum stores like the MoMA store, the Museum of Modern Art in in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, has a really interesting yeah. story. You walk in there and you'll say, "Oh my God, look! At that. That's a letter opener. I didn't know they could be like that. Or that's a chair. I didn't know they could do that. Or a clock, or whatever." <laughs> Those are pretty fascinating. No, that's great. Think, Those are amazing. Well, I think we're a little bit past time. I know everyone's probably dying to to ask a few more questions, but we want to respect Stu's time and everybody else's time. But again, if you want to um, get more details about all these great campaigns, definitely check out his book and then uh, let us know if you have any follow-up questions after the call. But thank you again so much, Stu. This is extremely helpful. I think everyone's going to be uh, enjoying this content for a long time. But uh, anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up, Stu? Uh, No, I guess I just that you know, if you want to buy the book, it's available on Amazon and Barnes. It's, it's available everywhere except where that books are sold except the airport, as far as I know. <laughs> anyway, okay. you could find That's it out enough. there. Yeah. Um, and thanks for thanks for the time. I really appreciated. Um, I mean, I really enjoyed telling your audience about this amazing stuff. These, these things are just so so much fun to to um, to study and to use and to see the effect of them. So um, anyway, thank you so much. No, thank you. It was great having you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We'll see you in two weeks. Take care, everyone.